Well, greetings in the precious, the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise amen. Him, amen, and praise Him, all honor and glory, through Him to the Father. Hallelujah. 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 We're so blessed that you can join us for this time in the Word. I promise you it is good to spend time in the Word, particularly in these days. Especially in these days. Especially in these days. <laughs> Because Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you will truly be my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. We are living in a time when there is a flood, a torrent of lies out there. And the only way you're going to know the truth is by hearing from God. So we're continuing on in our study. This is the uh, 14th, I think, part of our study in the prophet Amos. And uh, we're, we're looking at this as... I, I've said this, this is very pertinent to our days and to the last days, okay? Obviously, this was God speaking to the people of Israel in that time, mm -hmm. but I promise you it is God speaking to us in our times. Yes. And, and that's our, one of our primary reasons for, for spending time in this world, right? But before we do, let me just do this. Father, we thank you that we can gather. We thank you that you have said, where two or more are gathered in your name, there you are in our midst. We thank you for being in, the, in our midst, Lord, for bring, being ever-present help, Lord God. We thank you that you've sent your spirit into us, that we, be, we are, because of your choice, the temple of the Holy Spirit who is sent to lead us into all truth. Because, Father, we desire truth, and your Son is truth. We want to just be in your word so we can see him more clearly that we might be more and more like him. So we just thank you that you are at work, both the willing to work your good pleasure in our lives, making us day by day, bringing us from glory to glory, transforming us, Lord God, and conforming us into the image of your son, Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. So I said, uh, <clears throat> last week we spoke about God controlling the elements, natural events, to get the attention of his people, actually everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to get them to repent and return to him. So we ended on uh, Amos 5, verses 8 and 9. I'm just going to re read those, right? He who made the Pleiades and Orion and changes deep darkness into morning, who also darkens day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth, Yahweh is his name. It is he who flashes forth with destruction upon strong, upon the strong, so that destruction comes upon the fortress. We talked about discipline, loving correction, that is continually rejected by the people of Israel here. And, and that will result in destruction. Okay? You're going, to, you're going to choose his instruction, or you're going to choose his destruction. One is better than the other. Absolutely. But the choice is yours. All right? <clears throat> so if, if God is doing this, let me read you this. Take care, brethren, lest there should be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. But encourage one another today, day after day, as long as it's still called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast to the beginning of our insurance, firm until the end. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt, led by Moses. And with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they should not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? And so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. He's talking about his people yes. that he had delivered out of Egypt, right? Yes. Because of their unbelief. Where's that from? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Hebrews 3, where I read verses 12 through 19. Thank you. Well, belief... Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's what it says in Romans 10, 17. 
But think about this, because this is what I God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, roughly the same time, a little after, uh, actually, crossing over with Amos. But Amos is from the south, up in the north prophesying. Isaiah is basically down in the south. And this is God, he, God speaking through him, and he says, for this is a rebellious people, false sons, sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, you must not see visions, and to the prophets, you must not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us pleasant words. Mm -hmm. Prophesy illusions. Get out of the way, turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, since you have rejected this, this word and have put your trust in oppression and guile and have relied on them, therefore this iniquity will be to you like a breach about to fall, a bulge in a high wall whose collapse comes suddenly in an instant, whose collapse is like the smashing of a potter's jar, so ruthlessly shattered that a shard will not be found among its pieces to take a fire from the hearth or to scoop water from a cistern. For thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, In repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you were not willing. That's Isaiah chapter 30, right, verses 9 to 15. He said, but this is a rebellious people. He's talking about his people. He says, a rebellious people, false sons. You know, God spoke through Paul. Paul wrote to the church at Rome. Romans chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 28 and 29. He said, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. So, you know, this is not just Paul in the New Testament. Even in the Old Testament, it said, circumcise the foreskin of your heart, right? <clears throat> and Jesus said to the brethren at the church of Philadelphia, this is from Revelation chapter 3, I'm reading verses 7, the letters to the seven churches, right? He said, he's speaking to the, the church of Philadelphia, to those, he says, and this is a quote, who kept his word and have not denied his name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews, but are not, and lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Revelation 3, 9. Not all who call themselves Christians are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and are led by the Holy Spirit to live by his teachings and keep his commandments. Not all. Well, last week we spoke, because it's here in Amos, about the remnant. Right? He said, you know, speaking of his people, he says a thousand will go out, but a hundred, only a hundred will return. He said a hundred will go out, and only ten will return. That's a remnant. Yes. Remember Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount about the many and the few? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the path that leads to destruction is, is broad and easy, and many are those who will choose that. Mm -hmm. But the path that leads to life, that righteous path, is straight and narrow, and few are those who will find it. The many and the few. Whenever it's the many and the few, well, you want to know something? It's the many who are choosing the wrong way. Right? <clears throat> Have you not heard the parable that Jesus spoke to his disciples about the wheat and the tares? Yes. Now talk about church growth. <laughs> wow. Overnight, that person's field multiplied. Multiplied in number and size, right? Listen carefully, pastors, and those of you who desire the large churches. If you desire a big church, that's your goal. You have a partner who is working tirelessly with you. His name is Satan. That's right. Because he desires that your church, your congregation, the size of your congregation gets bigger. Think of this. Jesus answered and said to them, this is in Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 and 5, talking about the last days. Jesus answered and said to his disciples, to them, see to it that no one misleads you. For many, 
will come in my name saying, I am anointed and will mislead many. Now, your Bible may very well say, say that I am the Christ. First of all, the word the is not there. And the word Christ, this is the, this is the word Christos in Greek that means anointed. You know, it's easy to say, well, if somebody shows up and says, I'm Jesus, oh, I'll recognize that. But what about when somebody calls up, shows up and says, I'm anointed, I'm God, I, you know, God has anointed me. You better still test their teaching. If they're telling you that they're anointed with their teaching or their prophecy or their, their ministry, you all the more you should be testing them, checking them out. Jesus also said, that was Matthew. That was Matthew 24, right? This is where Jesus, the apostles, came to him and said, tell us, what will be the signs of your coming in the end of the age? But in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, Jesus said, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Why do you think they're dressed like sheep? So they won't be noticed among the flock. They're coming into the flock. They're not standing outside throwing slings and arrows. They're getting inside. It's your and if you don't believe that, think about what the Apostle Peter wrote in, in his second letter, 2 Peter 2 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Satan wants to fill up your congregations with false sons to destroy God's work. That's not going to work because you know what? Satan doesn't have, isn't going to overcome God. But the, the problem is if you are a shepherd of a flock, you better be on guard for them and you better shepherd them. Okay, Amos 5.10. What's going on here? They have rejected the word and God says to Amos, they hate him who reproves in the gate and they abhor him who speaks with integrity. The people of the Israelites, the people of God, here in Israel at this time, and we talked about how they had formed their own religions last week, right? Own religious practices. And yet, they, they abhor him who speaks with integrity, who reproves in the gate. What's the ministry of a prophet? Well, it says in Lamentations 2, 2, uh, I think it's 14, either 10 or 14, that the ministry of a prophet is God sends them to ex expose saints, the, the people of God, to expose their iniquity so that they will return, so that they can be corrected. We have to have a heart to receive correction. God's word, Paul says to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16, is profitable. It's profitable for correction. It's profitable for reproof. It's profitable for teaching. It's profitable for training in righteousness. Our great desire, our great desire for being here in this study should be to be trained in righteousness. To grow in our knowledge of, of the Lord. Okay. But they don't want to hear it. And that's why, that's why the Lord <laughs> speaks through Amos again. Just shortly after this, to say, this is from Amos chapter 8. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. It's not a famine because the word's not going out. It's a famine for hearing what God is saying, all right? When Jesus, think about this now. When Jesus taught about the bread of life, being the bread of life, it said many, not a few, many of his disciples, they found his words too hard, right? Too uncomfortable, not lining up what they already believed. It's easy to receive what you already believe. But you know what? You don't know it all. So the purpose of being in the Word is God is changing us. He is a God of revelation. He is increasing. We're growing in our knowledge and understanding of the Word. It's challenging. And it's changing. Mm -hmm. Right? Changing. Growing. Right? Mm -hmm. And that led to 
the apostles saying, therefore, it says, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can hear it? John 6, 60. They, they're saying, they're saying God's word is too difficult. God's word is not too difficult unless you're not prepared to do it. If you're not willing to do it, you're going to find it's the most amazingly hard thing in the world to face. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But if you have a willingness to do God's word, you're going to find that that Holy Spirit working within you is going to empower you to do yeah, it. Right? That's right. You and can't do it on your own at all. That's no, you right. can't. And God doesn't desire you yeah. to. That's why, that's you know, in Proverbs 3, it says, lean not on your own understanding. He doesn't want you to figure it out. He wants you to hear from him. Take instruction. Faith comes by hearing. Okay? And that led to, in John, a couple of verses on, it says, as a result of this, many, there's that many again, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. That's John, chapter 6, verse 66. Well, isn't that a coincidence? 666. What a coincidence. And indeed, it's a last day's thing. All right? Because Paul writing to Timothy in that same letter, the second, second letter to Timothy in the fourth chapter, he says this, for the time will come when they will not, when they, talking about the body, here, the church, the, 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 the quote unquote the disciples, they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. That's why there are so many out there preaching, tickling. Absolutely. Messages. But that's also why there were the high places of Bethel and Gilgal, where Israel had set up their own religious practices, because they had turned aside to myths. They had turned from the truth of the word of God, and they started to follow mythology. They started to follow fables, fables from the pagan world. You know, I, I don't want to, uh, yeah, I, I do, I do want to do this. I'll, I will sidetrack. I'm talking about, I, I, how many times have I used the word disciple here in the short time we've been together? In this week? God has called us to be disciples. Yes. And yet, that's not a word that is common anymore. Because it's too closely related to discipline. Not too closely related. It's the same word. All right? A disciple is somebody being dis disciplined by God. Discipline does not mean punished. It means being trained. And in that training, and I think I mentioned this last week, you are, what you're doing correct, God is encouraging and strengthening. What you're doing wrong, God is correcting. That's discipleship. Well, you don't hear that word. What you hear is mentoring. Do you, do you hear, have you heard it? Have you, think about this. In the church, the congregation that you're a part of, have you heard the word mentor or disciple more? Well, are you aware of the fact that you're hearing about mentor? Are you aware of, fact, of the fact that that comes from Greek mythology? Maybe even Greek history. Because mentor was an advisor that the king had put in charge of his son when the king went off to war, I think to the Trojan War, right? An advisor does, they'll give you counsel, which you are then free to, to accept yeah. or reject, which you are then free to act upon or not act upon. A disciple doesn't have a counselor, doesn't have somebody giving suggestions. A counselor, uh, we have a master. We have, that's the word, by the way, I think in Italian, I think it may be in Latin, the word for teacher is maestro. maestro. Which is where we get the word master from, right? When Jesus tells you to do something, that's not, not a suggestion. That's a command. It is a command. And he said, if you love me, keep my commandments, all right? He has authority over Right. Us. So but here, what they're doing is they're walking away from Jesus because his word is too difficult. Mm -hmm. right? When you get separated from the word, you are in peril. Yes. Deep, deep peril. What we're talking about here, what we see in John 6, 6, is, a, is falling away. Yes. Well, more than falling away, I mean, it's not like they're tripping over rocks. I mean, it is desertion. Right. 
It is apostasy. And listen, they don't have to go out and become Buddhists or Hindus or Muslims or atheists when they walk away. Keep doing what they were doing. They just go to another church. One of the many that preaches a message that tickles their ears and plays to their own desires. And there are plenty of those to go around. There's a lot of places to choose. Welcome to the Church of Laodicea. I mean, that's the epitome of this, where the congregation is having a great time inside, and they're boasting of how great things are, while the Word of God Himself stands outside, unwelcome and uninvited inside to participate in their religious worship services. Isn't that true? Yes, absolutely true. That's the picture of the Church of Laodicea. Mm -hmm. Now, I hope you caught the verbal quotes that I put around the word worship. Mm -hmm. You have to wonder what they're worshiping inside the Church of Laodicea. But they're worshiping something. You know, it was Bob Dylan that wrote a song and, and, and said, uh, you got to serve somebody, right? Everybody's going to serve somebody. Man was designed and built, created to praise, to worship God. And as Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Matthew 6, 24. So that leads me to bring to our attention, well, what happens if people like those in Laodicea are boasting they I say, worshiping what they have accomplished. Because certainly the Lord wasn't involved. And isn't that what they're doing? We're rich, we have need of nothing. They're boasting in what they've accomplished. <clears throat> well, bear that in mind as I read to you from Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. That's what they were doing on Bethel. Mm -hmm. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their woman exchanged a natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another. Men with men, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Read it. Go read it. Test it. Like I said, you know, I'm not asking you to take my word for any of this. Go see what the Word of God says. Homosexuality, which is now promoted and celebrated in the world around us, and, and much of the church around us, mm -hmm. is indeed a sin. But it is also a symptom of a far greater sin. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. What is the truth of God? His word. His, his truth is revealed to us through his word. They've exchanged it. They have walked away from his word. What was happening in the time of Paul was what was happening in the time of Amos, a rejection of God's word. And when you reject God's word, it can only lead to this terrible, terrible result, right? And think about this. I've said Satan has chosen homosexuality as his, his choice battlefield. Well, because he can disguise it as love. Homosexuality is all about love. No, it is not. Homosexuality is about sex. It is, listen, it's not about a man loving a man. We're commanded to love each other. I love you, Mark. Don't want to have sex with you, but I love you. 
It's not about love, it's about sex. So he's disguising. Everybody's talking about, well, don't you care that people, these people love each other? Go ahead and love each other. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what you're supposed to be doing. But it doesn't have to manifest, manifest itself as a sexual act. Exactly. You see, what happened was because they rejected the word of God, because they traded the word of God, the truth of the word of God for a lie, their love became perverted. Go read what I just read to you from Romans chapter 1 again and see what we're talking about is perversion. But the act follows the truth that it's their love that has been perverted. Got that? So let me just read Amos 5, 11 and 12 now. Therefore, because you impose heavy rent on the poor and extract a tribute of grain from them, though you have built houses of well-hewn stone, yet you will not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, yet you will not drink their wine. For I know your transgressions are many and your sins are great. You who distress the righteous and accept bribes and have turned aside the poor and the gain. The motivation for the things that God is, is calling them out about here is selfishness, which is, the, which is the opposite of love. It's love of self rather than a love that goes out, right? It is not, as I said before in the study, about a social gospel, all right? Taking care of the poor, the rent, all these things, that's not a social gospel. That is a spurious and specious concept. There's only spurious. one guy. Spurious and specious, that's basically redundant. It basically means that it appears true, but it's false. I mean, people will accept that as true, but it's false, okay? It's, it's not a social gospel. There's only one gospel, and that gospel is about God's love. All right? So what we're talking here about when you're taking care of the poor and the needy, you're talking about God's love. It's not the act that matters. It's the love that motivates and generates and powers the act. Right? Is, is God's love not rooted in giving? Absolutely. He gave his only begotten son. Thank you so much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16. And then in, in, in 1 John 3, 16, it says... We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Listen to me. You can give without loving. Yes. But you can't love without giving. All right? We're, we're to love not because it makes us feel good, although it should make you feel good, we are to love the brethren and the neighbors and the enemies because we love God and have his love poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That's what it says in Romans 5.5. 5. And that's where we're going to have to end this study today. <laughs> because time flies when you're having fun. So, Father, we just thank you. We thank you that we can gather in your presence and in your word, Lord. And use your word, Lord God, to mold us, to shape us, to make us more and more what you desire us to be. Your will, your good pleasure in our lives, Lord God. We praise you and thank you for your Son, Christ Jesus, the Word who has made flesh and dwelt among us. Well, until next time, God bless you and be used for the glory of His name. We'll see you next week. Bye. So I cherish that old rugged cross till my true. Please.